please give a warm welcome to our acting commander of TRADOC. Well, thank you all very much. And uh, General Cody, sir, thank you for those uh, kind words of introduction and for your many years of leadership, which have imp impacted so many in our Army, including your guest speaker here tonight. So I don't know if you remember, several years ago, we were at a, uh, a meeting, and after you had made some remarks, and everybody's leaving uh, for a moment there. The two of us were kind of squished up together, getting through the door, and you looked at me, and you said, stick with us. And a lot of people would say that uh, it's awful hard to impart any leadership in just three little words, but uh, at that point, at that time, for this Brigadier General in those days, those were exactly the words I needed to hear, and, uh, and I... Glad that I followed, uh, followed your lead, and I'm sure your leadership is continuing to have a profound effect across our Army and across our nation, and I, for one, am thankful for that and all you do. And speaking of uh, leadership, I want to say thanks to the Army Cadet Command and its commander, uh, General McDonald, for developing such promising leaders as we have out here today. Uh, thank you for inviting me here to address this uh, distinguished group. And congratulations to all of you who are uh, getting ready to, uh, to graduate, and congratulations to Cadet Command as well for your upcoming 25th anniversary this June. The proof of the success of your command and all that you do is sitting out here in this group of uh, Marshall awardees, and it demonstrates the quality of your work. And uh, thanks uh, to Mr. Shaw as well and to the Marshall Foundation for helping us recognize these outstanding young leaders. I want to uh, also congratulate uh, General McDonald and Cadet Command for the tremendous conference that they have put together for this group of honorees. I've only been able to participate in uh, a bit of the activities, but I had the chance to review the agenda and see all of the distinguished uh, speakers that you've had and all the many issues of strategic and international importance that you all have been addressing. And this is all good uh, as the times that uh, we are facing our, uh, we have decisions of enormous importance to make for our nation and for our Army. And in the coming days and weeks, those decisions that will be made will affect the shape and operations of our Army in significant ways. Now, up front, as, uh, as General Cody alluded to, I should, uh, I should apologize to you for not being uh, General Marty Dempsey, who just a couple of weeks ago was the TRADOC Commanding General and uh, has moved on to be the Chief of Staff of the Army. And I should apologize for not being General Cohn, who next week will be the uh, Commanding General of TRADOC. If there's anything unfortunate about this uh, conference, it is that the timing came when the only guy in the headquarters was the, uh, was the Deputy Commanding General. And I'm not going to be so bold as to uh, pretend that I know all the answers to the weighty decisions that we are uh, engaged with uh, right now. And even if I did, I'm definitely not bold enough to uh, stand here and tell you what all the, uh, all the answers are. So suffice it to say that uh, in times of tough decisions, it's important to have good leadership and we certainly have that with our new Chief of Staff of the Army, my former boss, uh, uh, General Dempsey. So what I want to do tonight then is, is just pull our focus in a little bit from some of the loftier strategic issues that many of you have been, uh, have been talking about in this conference and uh, talk a little bit about leadership and about leadership development and leadership that, uh, that we'll be looking for all of you in our Army. And being mindful that I am the last speaker here for this conference. I'll try and keep my comments short. So here we go. There are a lot of things that our Army does, our nation asks us to do, and you could have a lengthy discussion, and you probably have uh, in this last couple of days, over what it is that is the core competency of the United States Army, what it is that, uh, that we do that others don't do. And I have like to assert over the time that one of our key core competencies, and maybe the core competency, is in fact developing leaders. You just can't stay in the Army very long if you are not a leader. When I was starting out as an engineer many, many years ago, we had Spec 7 bulldozer operators, and they were responsible for themselves. They were E7s responsible for themselves only and their bulldozer, and that, that was it. No leadership responsibility. You can't do that anymore. 
You cannot remain in the Army, get beyond the, the rank of specialist if you do not become a leader. And of course, for all of you, you can't even begin your career without, uh, without being a leader. You know, from time to time in the Army, we've tried to figure out how do you measure the combat power of military units. And there have been a lot of different formulas where you try and compare one unit to another. And uh, one of, of my favorite descriptions or my favorite yardsticks that we use shows that combat power of a unit is a function of several things. One is the mobility, the ability of the unit to be able to move around uh, and get advantage. So mobility is one, firepower is another, the, the size and power number of your weapons. Protection is one, your ability to, uh, to take a shot from the enemy and continue the, the fight. And this formula shows that the, the most important one is leadership. And the, the formula is that combat power is a function of mobility, firepower, protection, all in parentheses, multiplied by leadership. So leader development is a key to our army. Matter of fact, I read, I was reading on the helicopter ride up here from uh, Fort Monroe, uh, the new army strategic uh, planning guidance. And in there, it says about leader development that our leadership, our leaders in the army are our asymmetric advantage over our competitors. So it is a key, key thing that we do in TRADOC and it's a key importance for our new chief of staff as well. Now, at the beginning of my remarks, I thanked Major General McDonald and the U.S. Army Cadet Command for developing the leaders that we are honoring here tonight. This is no small thing that they have accomplished. There were some periods in our Army's history when we really didn't have much of a leader development program. As our Army expanded very, very quickly to meet the needs of World War I, and again in World War II, we needed a lot of leaders and we needed them fast. And we didn't have time to do a lot of development. I know of officers in World War II who were commissioned in 1941, joined their new units that were just forming up as platoon leaders, and three years later were battalion commanders commanding battalions in combat. Not much time for leader development. And the leader development technique that we used in both World War I and World War II was to replace commanders until you found somebody that was up to the job. So the idea here was that natural leaders were out there somewhere in our formation, and if you could just sort through the chaff, while well, you could find the good ones. So for a good part of our early history in our Army, our leader development program consisted mainly of repeatedly relieving commanders until we got the right, the right person in place. In World War I, we relieved about three division commanders for every division that was, uh, that was committed, and it was almost the same in World War II. And so our Army kind of thought, well, gosh, if, if this technique is good enough for Blackjack Pershing and it's good enough for Dwight Eisenhower, then gosh, it ought to be good enough for the rest of the Army. And when I came into the Army, I suspect the same with General Cody. Uh, I remember division commander flying in in his helicopter with his G3 in the back, and uh, G3 would get out, he'd be your new battalion commander, the CG would take your battalion commander and, and fly off. And it wasn't that unusual to happen. Well, this causes a lot of, of turmoil in a, in a unit, as you can only imagine. It makes personnel management a real chore. It's, uh, it's horribly inefficient, and it creates a climate of fear. And at some point in our army, we arrived at the idea that perhaps leaders could be developed. It was not the situation that you were simply born a leader or not. It could be taught. And if you believe that this is true, that leadership can indeed be taught, then it will affect your entire leadership style. For if leadership can be taught, then all of us have a duty to develop the leadership skills in our subordinates for our Army's sake, for our nation's sake, and for our soldiers' sake. I, for one, this idea is all across the Army, but I'm here to tell you that I, for one, uh, firmly believe that leadership can be developed in others. And I have that belief because I got to see it up close and, uh, and personal. When I was a, a cadet, it was my fortune that uh, my company of 25 cadets was under the supervision of a tactical officer named Captain Boyd Harris, Mac Harris, as he liked to be called. And uh, he had spent some time uh, studying leadership. He got his master's degree in 
organizational behavior or something like that, but basically he was studying leadership at the Army's expense. And uh, his payback for that was writing field manual 22-100, uh, leadership now called 6-22, uh, and that was the first time that we had written our leadership manual in, in some time. And I, I suspect that many of you are familiar with 622. It's probably one of the textbooks that you use in your courses. Um, it introduced uh, a lot of uh, great ideas in there, and it, it was really a remarkable manual. At the time, it was the first leadership manual that had been uh, written since World War II, and it introduced the ideas of leader attributes, direct leadership, organizational leadership, strategic leadership, and it demonstrated the power of leadership through a number of examples like Joshua Chamberlain at the Battle of Little Round Top. Now, Captain Harris would get us all together on, uh, on Saturday mornings. We had, to, we had to go to class on Saturday mornings, and he'd get, us, he'd get us together, and he would talk to us about leadership. He'd talk to us about the Army's duty to the nation, and he showed us how things like Shining our shoes was important to the defense of the United States of America. He was inspiring, and I still get goosebumps to this day. When I think of his commitment, his determination that each of us would become leaders worthy of our soldiers and our nation. Of those 25 cadets that had Mac Harris as our TAC for, for two years, four of us eventually made general officer, and that has not happened, had not happened since World War II, and to my knowledge, uh, has not happened again. The 25 folks that came after me and a year after me uh, only got Mac Harris for one year. Uh, two of those made general officer. One's a corps commander right now, and the other one just, uh, just gave up a corps. Pretty, uh, pretty remarkable feat, a great record, and there's no doubt in my mind that the reason that our small group produced so many senior leaders for the Army is because of the development that we received at the hand of Mac Harris, a leader who was committed to the development of other leaders in the Army. He's a living example of the power of uh, leader development, and it was our, our armies and our nation's loss when uh, he was struck down just a few short years later by, by illness. But he left behind him a legacy that I'm con convinced uh, continues to this day. As the TRADOC Deputy Commanding General, it is uh, one of my opportunities that I get is to talk to battalion and brigade commanders around our Army, and I tell them to talk to their lieutenants and their captains about service, about Army values, and about what it means to be a leader. I tell them that our FM 6-22 on leadership is pretty darn good reference to use in those discussions. You know, we ask our commanders to talk a lot uh, with their officers about all kinds of things. I suspect your PMSs routinely talk to you about any, any number of things, and it is all too often that leader development ends up getting the short end of the stick. Your commanders owe it to you, and you owe it to your soldiers. Leader development is a core competency of our Army, and we all need to treat it that way. And so because of all the leader development that goes on in Cadet Command, again, I want to pass on my sincere thanks uh, to General McDonald and all the dedicated men and women in the United States Army Cadet Command for their inspired efforts and accomplishments in developing our future leaders for our Army and our nation. And the proof that uh, you deserve such thanks is uh, sitting right out here in, in this auditorium. So well done to Cadet Command. Now those of you that are sitting out here will shortly be joining the ranks of the Army's leaders and your leadership will be needed. Of that you can be sure. You know, just think about it for a little bit, what it is that uh, we ask of our soldiers and our units. If you are a civilian, you can get a license to drive an 18-wheeler in a few weeks straight out of high school. But nobody is going to hire you to drive that truck because no insurance company will insure you. You've got to be in your late 20s, early 30s, uh, be married with a couple of kids, have a big mortgage on a house before anybody thinks you've got the maturity and the reliability to trust with uh, running a big, down and a big rig down the road. Yet in the Army, we take 19-year-olds, teach them to drive the biggest truck out there, then make them drive it off-road, through the trees, at night, with the lights off. What the heck is up with that? You know, another example is it's illegal in the United States to own, possess, transport, or use an automatic weapon. 
Yet in the Army, we routinely give them to 18, 19 year olds. We let them carry them through airports. Heck, they even uh, carry them when the president is around, and sometimes that 18 or 19 year old is uh, protecting the president. We even make them crew members on crew served weapons that have enormous destructive power. Why do the American people let us do these kind of things? How can they sleep at night knowing the kind of things that you and your soldiers are up to every day? <laughs> well, let me tell you, the American people rest comfortably every day because they know that all of these young men and women, their sons and daughters, who are performing dangerous tasks on their behalf, who are putting themselves and others in danger of life and limb, are doing so under the leadership and guidance of a select group of people. Americans are comfortable with what they've asked us to do because they know that our soldiers are led by those in whom they have reposed special trust and confidence to do the right things, to make the right decisions under the most trying conditions. And they have empowered us, they have empowered you to provide that leadership by giving us their commission to issue orders in their name and to enforce those orders under the Uniform Code of Military Justice with penalties up to and including death if necessary. This is no small thing. The leadership that is being asked of you is the leadership that calls you to be responsible for everything your unit does or doesn't do. Responsible for everybody in your unit and for their individual behavior. What other occupation asks so much of its leaders and asks it at all levels? You're darn tootin' that leader development is an important thing and thanks to all of you for committing yourselves to it. You know, in a short while, you'll get the experience to be lieutenants, officers in our Army. As lieutenants, you'll have a lot of people looking up to you for your guidance, for direction, for encouragement. Young soldiers striving to become sergeants, to be responsible for more than just themselves, will be modeling themselves after the leadership example that you set. Older NCOs with much more experience and tactical knowledge than uh, you, you will have will be looking to you also for direction and guidance. And this can be pretty intimidating stuff. But don't worry, you all are going to do just fine. Lots of your soldiers are going to have more knowledge than you. Some of your young soldiers uh, will have had multiple tours in combat even, and they'll be real experts. But with all their knowledge and with all their experience, they'll still be looking to you to provide that which only you can provide. As the leader of your unit, as a platoon leader, only you can set the tone for that unit establish the values by which your unit operates, and only you can set the example of discipline and commitment that only the leader can provide. So know that from the first moment that you join your unit, your soldiers will be looking to you for the values and the climate of commitment and service that you will establish for your unit. They want to be part of a top-notch discipline unit, and they know it depends on the attitude and the climate that you are going to set in your unit and that you will do that well, I have absolutely no doubt. Shortly, you all will be getting one of the rarest, most fulfilling opportunities that a college graduate can get anywhere, leading a group of America's sons and daughters who have raised their hands in a time of war and volunteered to serve this great nation of ours. There is simply nothing like it. Daily contact with soldiers you just can't help but love because of who they are and what they represent, everything that is good about our great nation. I think I speak for all the senior leaders here in saying that our fondest memories of our military service are those of leading soldiers directly, knowing them personally, watching them strive to achieve your intent, struggling at times as young people invariably do, invariably do and watching them achieve your intent to even higher standards than you asked them to, even higher standards than, than you thought possible. And I know, I know I speak for all the senior leaders here in saying that when they served at the highest levels of responsibility, their number one goal was to empower our soldiers, protect them, provide the equipment, training, and leadership that they so richly deserve. All of us envy you the experiences that you are about to enjoy leading our troops. It's an enormous privilege, one of the most rewarding and fulfilling experiences that you can ever have. And all we ask in return is that you provide 
what your soldiers want and need, what your army and your nation demand of you, and that's leadership. So congratulations to all of you for being recognized by your institutions for the leadership you've already demonstrated. Congratulations to all of those in U.S. Army Cadet Command for developing that leadership in you. And on behalf of our Army and our nation, thanks. Thanks to all of you in advance for the inspired, dedicated, selfless leadership that I know you will provide to our great soldiers and which I am absolutely positive our soldiers deserve. Congratulations on having a great conference here and for sticking it out to the bitter end on the last speaker with me. I look forward to serving in this great army with each of you. Best of luck to all of you. Godspeed to all of you and God bless each and every one of you and all of your soldiers wherever they serve. Thank you very much and good night.